It's Mun Lee's here. How are things? Very good, thank you. So he's, we've got a headline on the back of the Herald this morning, Ray Cosgrove, saying that there's no helicopters, no gear, no free boots for the dubs. It's probably no helicopters, as Nathan rightly pointed out, it doesn't make logistical sense. Do you buy that they don't have any free gear or any free boots? I think, I just read that when I was outside waiting there, um, but I think he was talking about his under-16 development squad. Uh, for his, for at senior level, there's provisions there for all senior county teams to get their to get their boots and in fairness in leash we're, we're very well looked after you get two pairs of boots a year so you get uh, to depend- your own boots you do depends on how good you're kicking you might save the letter on them but nah two, two pairs of boots a year and uh, in fairness in leash we're very well looked after now we have no complaints on that front how do you look back on this summer as a leash footballer obviously two disappointing defeats which knocked you out of the championship I presume that the Cork defeat in particular you kind of felt that the magnitude of this just wasn't deserving of what Leash had put in all year yeah, that part of it was disappointing for us because we had set our set our sights firmly on trying to beat Westmead in the first round because they had beaten us twice in the league and we felt they kind of caught us on, on the hop a little bit up in Mullingar in the earlier stages of the league and we should have learned our lessons from that. Uh, but then in the league final, I suppose more so to ourselves, we made some of, some of the same mistakes that uh, we were trying not to make uh, and thankfully we got to put that right in the first round of the championship. Um, and then after after that we we kind of came apart against um, Meath as well, even though it, it was a, quite a substantial score difference in the end. We played well through, through long periods and we got hit for, for a couple of goals, um, one just before halftime through a penalty that, that really rocked us and, and so on. So we didn't feel that that was a, a fair reflection. And then we got back on the road in, in the qualifiers and we started making some headway and we got to blood some new players and you know John Sugar was, was uh, adamant about trying to build a squad this year and so on and and we did that thankfully through the qualifiers and then we just um, the, the power and pace of Cork just caught us and uh, I suppose when, when you're trying to build a squad and playing week on week it's difficult if you pick up a couple of injuries and so on that uh, when you are trying to maybe make up the ground on, on the top teams as such that uh, for, for a team like us who's developing, you, you want to have a full squad to pick from every day. We were out Mark Timmons, who's top class defender. You know, I think he'd make any team in, in Leinster, certainly. So uh, things like that go against you, but just credit to Cork. They were, they were phenomenal on the day, and they've certainly got, their, got themselves um, back on track after being relegated to, to Division 3, and, and th- they might have a say in the, in the Super 8s yet. Is there a sense that what happened to Mayo at the weekend is kind of similar to what happened to you, you just kind of run out of legs at the end of the year, a couple yeah. of injuries? Yeah, I would definitely think that about Mayo. I've been, I, I saw the match at the weekend, and I, I'm just following some of the commentary on it on it after. I think Tommy wanted me to referee between the two E about what was... <laughs> what, what the, Fortunately, the they've already was. delivered the knockout blow. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say it's a knockout blow. I think, to, to be fair to Mayo, playing four weeks in a row is very difficult. Uh, it's particularly difficult if you if you lose a couple of players and, and they're trying to get the likes of Killian O'Connor back into the team. They're without Dearman O'Connor. I think four weeks in a row for amateur players is not a fair task. I think for Mayo, who went into the qualifiers fairly early, I think we need to reward teams for redemption through the back door and uh, okay when you're going through the qualifiers they have no problem playing week on week but the Super 8 is, is a new element of the competition you should have a week to freshen up and I, I believe if, if, if Mayo can get over Mead this weekend and then they have a week break that's going to be one hell of a game in, uh, up, in, up in Mayo against, uh, against Donegal it, it, it could be one of the classics mm. you know with the way that both of those teams play so I, I, I think Kerry are good, are they as good as they were at the weekend? Not so sure. Are Mayo as poor as they were at the weekend? It just felt they were really flat. And I think the difference is somewhere somewhere in between, but I, I wouldn't be writing Mayo off just yet. Do you think James Horn, w- I don't want to say he would have been expecting that performance from Mayo, but do you think he would have been aware that there was a possibility of that sort of performance last Sunday? When he looked at them during whatever training sessions they can do on a Tuesday and Thursday night, as you say, after yeah. having three matches, that... Like, does that flatness just appear when the shoving match starts between Aidan O'Shea and David Moore at the start of the game? Is that when you're first aware of it? Or on a Thursday night can you go, actually, these players aren't where I need yeah. them to be three uh, days out from going to Kerry? Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a, relatively new, it, it's a relatively new system that we have with, this, with the Super mm. 8s, and especially if you come in off the back of a successful qualifier campaign. And, you know, let, let's 
call it honestly about Mayo, they had some difficult games. Uh, they had games that went right to the wire. They didn't really have, they didn't really <clears throat> wash anybody in the in the qualifiers. So they, w they were in all those games right to the end. You have the travel on top of that, and then. Horn is is going into that, and he's and he's probably thinking, okay, I have to maximise energy levels here across three games, and we mightn't have to win all three of them. Two wins might just get us through, through here. So I think um, maybe replacing Lee Keegan towards the end and and things like that might be might have been an indication that he he was saying, listen, this game could be gone here. Let's start thinking about uh, next week against Mead. And as a as I said, no more than if you're a player throughout those hectic schedules, uh, being able to manage your own energy levels and, and knowing what what you have to do midweek. and But it makes it very difficult if you pick up one or two niggles and it's if, if, if you're you know a leader in the team, whereas it's hard to skip a session in those in-between games where you maybe need to refresh. You, you probably want to get out on the field for your own mental state and get going and get some momentum behind you into the week. Whereas if you have a two-week break, you can skip a session and, and hit the gym and, and you know three or four days will will replenish you and you and get you back and you've travel on top of that as well and, and you know going to Killarney last week I just think it was accumulation of things that maybe caught up with with Mayo it's not that long ago since they had a, a solid league campaign and, and beat Kerry in the final so uh, as I said I wouldn't be I wouldn't be writing them off but uh, certainly uh, for managers in in the Super Eights about trying to manage that uh, that three game phase. Should he have made more changes then? And one of the success stories, say, of the qualifier run it was seen for Mayo was the emergence of the likes of Fionn McDonough, Darren Cohn, James Carr, who backed up what they'd done in the league and had proven themselves that they could handle it at a championship level. The one place he didn't really seem to have much depth was in defence. And you look at goalkeeper up to number eight, like they're all incredibly experienced players. If you're talking Mayo's greatest ever team, they would be in the mix, the vast majority of them. But like Keith Higgins won the great cornerbacks of mm -hmm. the last 15 years, but he's 34 now. Yeah. Like Brendan Harris and Chris Barrett have been there for the last five, six years, week in, week out. It's hard to drop them, but when you're talking about that fatigue th that accumulates, like should he have made some other decisions and left out a couple of those players, brought in some fresh legs? Yeah, p potentially. As I don't know enough. About it. <laughs> you need to be in a squad and a group to understand what the what the replacements are like and what the quality of players coming through is. And uh, do you want to, out of fairness to trying to blood players, do you want to be throwing somebody in for against David Clifford yeah. or or Ganey or or O'Donoghue or these lads down in Killar Killarney in a in a very important game? So. I wouldn't be trying to tell or second guess what James Horn should be doing, but I suppose you're. It's not really like soccer where you can get and you can accumulate a squad and you can decide. You know, you heard all the the former players talk about Ferguson and how he'd say, "Now I want you in two weeks' time, and that's your game, and you're going to bring energy mm. to the team." It's harder to do that in in the GA because you have a smaller amount of games per season and you want to maximize when uh, you want to maximize your performances in it I know people say about blooding players it takes a little bit of time to do that and uh, as I said maybe Horn he probably wanted to have a good league campaign which he did that involves using using a lot of your stronger players as well and I just don't think it's a it's an easy mix on and especially going down to Killarney you don't want to be crew. I know. Oh yeah, we'd be saying if we'd, we'd, if we'd, we'd let Keith Higgins out and we'd be saying the up Brendan Harrison out. Yeah. We'd be saying, yeah, what did they do in trouble? And they're and they're top, they're top quality, top quality players. And and uh, I'm probably repeating myself, but uh, I think if you know, me and Mayo will be interesting this weekend. And after that, if if uh, Mayo got through, it heading to Castle Bar on the last day of the Super Eights for potentially an epic with a break as well with the break and that's crucial it seems to me on Sunday that there was almost just a, a complete meltdown for Mayo at times when, when it came to executing basic skills and they still managed to put up 15 points against Kerry so I would definitely hold the fire in terms of actually hailing this Kerry defence but on the flip side when you talk about this Mead performance up against Mead this week in terms of how they might set up in attack was there a systems failure as well did they approach the game in the right way is their forward unit set up in the right way to cause trouble during the Super 8s from the Mayo perspective, Mayo's perspective, 
Yeah, I think that if you if you look at it, probably maybe they, they would have been disappointed with some of the performances up front. But then they finished the game pretty strong in terms of Killian O'Connor smashing the crossbar. Andy Moore came in and kicked two brilliant points. Arguably, back in Croke Park, you probably we might see Andy Moore from the start uh, this weekend. And there's nobody better in the game from his perspective, from winning possession in these positions here. He's not really interested. I know his two points were, were a bit more from distance at the weekend, maybe because of circumstances or whatever, but uh, if in terms of Andy Morn, where he operates, he wins so much of his ball in these positions. And he not alone is he a really good finisher, but he's <clears throat> he also gives the option for people like uh, McLaughlin and so on coming in at pace that they just often feed off mm. him and so on. And, and as well, I think we got to give we got to give uh, Horn credit for throwing Killian O'Connor back into the mix, and he was starting to look sharp mm. in 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 the Mayo jersey last weekend. And if you're getting back to the likes of those, and maybe you have Cohen in there as well, you're starting to look at a fairly potent full forward line. <coughs> Whether they can get change off uh, of Mead in terms of the kickouts, Mead will obviously be very tuned into what Kerry did uh, with regarding shutting down clean possession from Mayo's own kickout at the weekend. But I certainly think if if Mayo get enough ball up the field, uh, whether to play Andy Moore or not, personally. I like him in a team because I, I just think he gives you that. I, I studied him very closely uh, last last year in the, the Newbridge to know where the back allowed. I, I was behind the goals in the first half and all of his runs, they're just so smart. They're, they're over here. He doesn't play like... You know, people talk about age and all this kind of rubbish. He doesn't. His runs are all here and winning possession. And if, more often than not, when he gets possession, he's in a scoring position. And the problem for a defender is... Okay, there's a one-on-one -on -one situation after developing, but it's very easy if the right kind of runs with like of Kevin McLaughlin coming off him, Carr, these fellas. That the goal that Phil McDonough scored against our man, the qualifiers, is that Andy Moran set up for him. Yeah, so he, so he, I just think he brings he brings that kind of an element. And Killian O'Connor, like what an achievement to become the all-time top scorer in in championship. Could have done it with that goal chance that to, on his weaker foot smashed the crossbar. So I just think there's there's probably more positives for for Mayo than people think. But in fairness to Mead. I think, in fairness, McEntee has done a good job with them. They probably were on the ropes last year a little bit, going through the qualifiers, and then they came up against Tyrone and they put in one hell of a performance for him and for the county. And they've grown in confidence from that. They're probably on on a small bit of an upward curve at the moment. They're gone to they're promoted up to division uh, to division one, which is where they will learn a huge amount. It'd be similar enough to the quality of games that they're going to get uh, through the Super Eights. Mead have a huge platform from Donald Keoghan at the back. I think he's Donald Keoghan is is a top class player and he's a brilliant defender, but also his ability to give Mead attacking options is phenomenal. I, I think he set up the two goals against Carlo in Port Leash, where his runs when when Mead are moving the ball up the field. If we're using them as, as the Blues, Kyogen will, will invariably end up at either five or six. But when they're moving the ball up the field, even if the ball is only at this stage, Kyogen just makes straight lines through through the centre of the park and invariably ends up in around this position that ends up in him, in him receiving a hand pass. And I think his two assists against Carlo in the championship for the goals was one was he passed a square the ball from here and another one from this position. So... He will take serious watching at the weekend from from a Mayo perspective with regard to his ability to, to, to be that platform and to set up the attacks. And, and, and we knew about that when we, when we played them in the championship. And still, he's so good at just ghosting away. One second he's there and because of... I think his physical attributes are very similar to Lee Keegan mm. insofar as when he hits top gear, he's gone and he cruises. Menton is strong. I think Menton and O'Shea is going to be a huge, huge battle this weekend. Uh, both very mobile players. Menton probably getting a little bit more forward than, than O'Shea at the moment. And he can score. I think he got two points at the weekend. He hit us for two goals. And 
he he's a type of player that on his day can be can be a game winner with regarding just that their ability to break from deep and find themselves in scoring positions. The danger is that they get stuck in a David Moore situation again, except it's Menton who is doing the David Moore role. And one of the issues there was, I guess it's kind of twofold. First of all, Aidan O'Shea had put in so many shifts throughout this year, and in the last couple of games, like Peter Cook kind of gave him a bit of a runaround. For some of the game against Galway, he wasn't at his best at the weekend against uh, Kerry, and that kind of led to a huge breakdown elsewhere in the Mayo team. They had Donald Vaughan on... David Moran, which wasn't a matchup. Do they just change it now and say to Ed O'Shea, listen, it doesn't matter if you're absolutely wrecked. We'll, just, we'll put you on Menton. At least you'll have a detailed job on what you're supposed to do here. You don't need to be the man all over the pitch as we expected you to be at the start of the summer. Yeah, and <clears throat> I think to be fair to to him as well, Dermot O'Connor is a huge, huge loss in the middle of the park for, for Mayo. He has that ability... His engine is second to none in, in terms of that midfield area. He gets his, his ability to get up and down the park and to chip in with scores. And he's a real leader in that team. So I think there has been a little bit of an adjustment around the centre of the park for, for Mayo as well. He was their, he's their captain this year too. And so hopefully we'll, we'll see him back, although with a, with a handbrake it's, it's difficult. So <clears throat> there has been that bit of an adjustment with Donny Vaughan coming back from injury and and you're right David Moran was phenomenal at the weekend and, and I think one of the things that David Moran doesn't get the doesn't get the, the recognition for is his kick passing mm. and his ability to find those mm. passes and s- certainly I didn't realise that until we were in training in the international rules I think it was 2014 and this guy can put a ball on your chest from 45 yards and the minute he gets it out around the middle of the field he looks for that pass so if, if, if you're in the Kerry forward line at the moment, you, you'd be really delighted that he's back and playing so well. And coming back to the argument that, or the conversation we had about Horn maybe trying to keep things fresh, <coughs> saw some of uh, Keane's tweets at the, or Keane's um, comments after the match at the weekend, and he was saying that they had to make a decision early on in the year to just focus on David Moore for the championship and get him through the league with a couple of cameo appearances but that his focus for the season was going to be in around that that midfield battle so can he do that when he's under an awful lot of pressure David Moore and that that sort of range of passing because like some of the passes he played on on Sunday were exceptional it it seemed that he had a lot of time to make those passes Mm. that actually as you say Mayo's midfield never really got near him like as the summer goes on and if they're going up against Dublin or Tyrone and maybe the midfield battle is a bit tighter and there's a bit more physicality, does he still have the wherewithal to play that sort of pass or can he get at him? In terms of ability, <coughs> he can do it. Mm. Uh, top players will always find space to, to make these passes and, and so on. And I, I think Dave Moore is the type, listen, he's done it all with Kerry. He's a leader in that group and he's a leader in the dressing room from, from my experience of playing with him as well. And okay, he mightn't have as much opportunity in his space as he got at the at the weekend and that game I suppose the the pace of that game was set very early on by Kerry but I think he get him into Croke Park again and, and, and so on and I, I think Dave Moore is capable of finding these boys on the inside line and uh, he's certainly a major asset to Kerry when he's fit. Part of it though was obviously a disastrous Mayo kick out on Sunday that has to be said. What do Mayo do on Sunday? It's been mentioned that perhaps they switch the keeper again just for Henley's kickouts. Like if you could meld them together and take Clark shots off with Henley's kickouts, you'd have the best goalkeeper in the country potentially. Do they possibly do that? And if not, how much can Meath exploit the Clark kickout? Can I, can I just ask one thing before you answer that? Yeah. Is <coughs> a goalkeeping malfunction like happened on Sunday? Is that always the goalkeeper's fault? No, it's not. And. I was looking at this game on, on on the TV, so it's very hard to see the runs that <coughs> are being made out the field for for the goalkeeper and for the short kickouts and and so on. And sometimes that can play into just being a split second off in terms of your energy levels and how how tuned into the game that you are because of fatigue and so on that we d- that we discussed early on. So yes, it it's in terms of your question. No, it's not all down to the to the goalkeeper. You can only hit the passes that are available to you. But in in saying that, 
I suppose with Clarkey, <clears throat> he has he has a very good long kick out, and he's able to he's able to find he can find those short kick outs as well. I suppose over the years, Henley has probably been selected because he can just ping them out, taking a couple of steps back. Mm-hmm. Whereas <clears throat> Clarkey needs a little takes a little bit more of a run out, and I always find from watching him that he gets them out to his left hand side. If he's if he's in goals here, you know, with, because of his because of his right foot, he can get them out a lot quicker this side of the field. But if he's going out this direction, he needs to angle it a little bit, and you can kind of you can guess what way they're they're Which going. Is the one That's from it. the 2017 final in the final minute that goes straight out of play. Yeah. So. So and and let's not forget this is an all star goalkeeper mm. as well. He's top class. So if Mayo were to change this weekend, would it be that big? Would it be that big of a of a story? Given how often that they've that they've rotated these guys, even through despite who the manager has been over the last mm. number of years. So it it just goes to show that it's not just linked to one manager. It's a couple of different managers that there has been this rotation process. So you have two top class goalkeepers. Maybe they might change it up up a little bit, but I certainly think it's. I think it fed into the overall maybe dip in energy in the Mayo team rather than. I certainly wouldn't be targeting one individual for it because we know when when Mayo are on their game and and they have that energy about them, they can get their kickouts out. And do me just copy what Kerry did, press right up, use the sideline as an extra defender as well when it comes to those short kickouts. Well, I think. Given that they only have a week to prepare for it, they're going to be looking at well, what was Kerry, what was mm. part of Kerry's success last weekend, and you would be taking elements of what the opposition did to frustrate Mayo, but then you can't rely on that overly too, because if if Rob Henley is does play at the weekend, then maybe some of that goes out goes out the window. And don't forget, just because Meath might try and copy what Kerry have done doesn't necessarily mean that it'll work because Mayo will be back in training this week and thinking, okay, how can we tweak tweak this a little bit and how can we create a little bit more space to get those shorter kickouts, uh, shorter kickouts going. So it's there's so much stuff goes on midweek in trying to prepare for these games. Uh, I think if Ke- if May Meath were to copy Kerry, they probably wouldn't do it as well given. Given that it's not their own idea, mm. and I also think uh, Mayo will be better on their kickouts this weekend. I think they'll be far better. One of the other teams you wanted to get your take on is Cork because you've seen them up close. I presume they went 15 on 15 against you that day in the round four qualifier because it certainly seemed that wasn't Acro Park uh, on Saturday, but it seemed that that was essentially how they approached Dublin. Yeah, uh, what struck me about the the Cork preparing for the Cork game this year was that we were coming up against in terms of our preparation all year going through the Division 3 a good number of defensive setups and we played Westmead in, in, in the first round of the championship and they were quite defensive Mead are fairly defensive as well at times with regards getting getting 14 men behind the ball at at stages then we had Derry in the qualifiers and we had we had Okay, an open game with Offaly, but the last number of years coming through Division Three and Four has all been about trying to break down defensive setups. What Cork brought that was refreshing against us was they just had so many players that would run at you, and they'd get the ball at midfield, and Rory Dean would be just looking for he'd hold hold that ball for a split second, waiting to see a gap that he would get through, and once they get that overlap, once they took that overlap, uh, they were very hard to 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 take back. You know, Hurley when he'd get on the ball, he'd take you on really aggressively, not just taking you on to try and score. This guy was taking us on to try and hit the back of the net every time, and he ended up with 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 two goals. So there were that real aggressive strike running at us was ca- caused us problems um, in that game and they obviously caused Dublin mm. problems from that perspective so last is that the weekend template then, the, the strike running is that the, the template to actually get at Dublin uh, well I, I think it, it paid dividend for can you say that given what they were beaten by uh, in the end up I think you can it, it, it I suppose the argument, the arg- it, it could be argued forward and back on that one but for, for long spells of the game they were they were very effective running at Dublin, and on the flip side of things, when you look at when you look at the likes of uh, Howard, Connor ha- Callahan, Kieran Kilkenny, Kieran Kilkenny, when they ran at Cork in a similar fashion, they also had success. So, mm. um, 
that's what I liked about Cork. That's what I think is. Well, that's why I think Cork are starting to play to their to their strengths again. I was talking to one of their backroom team after after the game in in Turles and this he said that they just after the league they just reviewed things and they felt that with with the squad that they had, let's just go out and be aggressive and yeah. and, and get three or four challenge games together. And I, I think they won all of them and they played against a lot of top teams and they just found their momentum and they found a mix that is mm. working for them at the moment and and they got some they got they put a lot of damage on Dublin at the weekend. The question, ob- sorry, because it's obviously been relatively successful. It's funny you talk about playing teams in Division Three and how so many of them set up defensively. Yeah. Like, suddenly a group of players been given some freedom and being told go out attack express yourself yeah yeah and it can work and you you look at where what cork had been trying to do in the last couple of years and I suppose the the relegation to the division 3 would have would have dented them but i think they were more defensive early on in the year and so you're you're now Going to Division Three and Four, a lot of defensive stuff will, will will be there again for them next year in terms of what they're coming up against. But I think their power and their the physicality of, of some of their players and the mobility um, was is really impressive at the moment. And they have they have forwards and running midfielders and, and halfbacks that will cause damage to teams. And fair play to them. They're, I think they're playing to their strengths. Can they damage that throw on defence though? Is the thing, Colum Kavanagh playing the sweeper role probably better than anybody else in the country at the moment. The sweeper role is something that Kerry were questioned with when they came up against Cork, but Tyrone have it down. Yeah, different different styles in terms of Cork really wanting to, to go at. Um, they want to be on the front foot for for the for the full 70 minutes, whereas Tyrone want to suck you in here, want you to make mistakes, and they will hit you really aggressively then. If you, if, if you turn over the ball mm. and give away a sloppy possession, they will really hit you coming at pace the, the opposite direction. So, <clears throat> this weekend, very hard to call in that regard. It's, it's up in Croke Park. I think Cork will still... I think Cork will still Caused their defence some trouble in terms of their their aggressive running. Probably fancy Tyrone with the momentum behind them to to edge it out though. And we're talking about Cork being naive the way they attacked Tyrone by the end of the game. Here, listen, this is all very good analysis. There's only one thing everybody wants to know: Leash's position in the Own Sheehan Power Rankings. What about it? Where are they? The Specsavers Power Rankings. Specs we bring, power bring rankings. Up I actually just saw him making a couple of adjustments to that there. Didn't Leash 16. 16th in the country. Well, you get in the top tier, that's good. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're playing top tier football behind the likes of Fermanagh, Clare, Kildare. Does that, does that great with the, the Leash contingent, I wonder? I think we should get him down to Port Leash to give a presentation on this. <laughs> <coughs> the Leash today, we've, we've a really good uh, online media presence down with Leash today. I think if Stephen Miller catches any of this with Leash today, we need to get you down for one of his podcasts to explain that. <laughs> you think they should be higher? You think he should be higher? Um, you obviously don't. <laughs> <coughs> no, I think. Uh, listen, we're we're back up to Division Two, which is important to us. We had very disappointing back-to-back relegations a couple of years ago. John Sugru came in when we were in gone to Division Four, and he said, "Listen, we need to rise higher. We need to to be a little bit different. We need to start playing smart, intelligent football and be able to adapt to to different uh, styles of play against us and so on. And he's under his guidance. We've got back to back promotions, which is very important because no more than Mead going to Division One next year and trying to survive there. And you see how Ross Common have developed trying to stay in that division and so on and, and it will have been good for Cavan as well it's important for us to get up there and to be playing against the teams that invariably are going to be playing in the Super 8s every year and trying to test ourselves as a group and try to bring on more and more young players and survive and be comfortable at that level and I think um, with, with with that ahead of us in, in the coming years um, and with John looking after the team I think we're, we're in a good place to to continue this slow development that we've had over the last 24 months. Just one thing that you mentioned earlier on in the analysis of Andy Moore, and you talk about people mentioning his age is absolute rubbish. Is that something that pisses you off? No, not in the slightest. Look, nobody knows, from, from the outside, nobody knows what goes on in a training. Nobody knows the level of performance uh, of 
individual players because of because of their age and so on. So I think we saw was it against Chelsea at the week or a couple of weeks ago? The Chels bring on a, a fourteen, year, 14 old. year old and, and so on. Yeah. Does age really matter? In my opinion, no. Uh, could Andy Moran do cause a absolute wreck at the weekend if he starts? Yes. Did he come on? Did he come on and look like a, a 36 year old, 35, 36 year old at the weekend against Kerry, who had totally dominated the game up to that? No, he kicked two super, two superb points. So, if um, regard to your question, if uh, media men like you are trying to irritate me over age, no, they, you wouldn't know. <laughs> you can say what you want. We're going to see you back next year, basically. <laughs> New five year deal. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got, you've got a busy summer though ahead of you, work wise and all that. Yeah, things are going well. Uh, I'm, I'm heading up our alumni department in DCU, so we've we've 80,000 graduates, and we, we operate a lot of uh, all our engagement strategies domestically and internationally. So, be really looking forward to seeing this man back at some of our reunion events say, this must, summer. You must wake up every morning and go, "My God, is this the best advertisement we can have for DCU?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's not bad. Now, in, in fairness to him, there's himself and Tommy out there. There were. They were the dream team around campus. They used to call themselves. So uh, we're <laughs> very, we're very well. proud. Yeah, we're very proud of them. In fairness, were they're Tom doing great work. Was tight back then. Uh, he was an impressive first-year footballer at the time. I think he he discovered the media and um, the high life after that. Yeah, but yeah. is Andy McIntyre missing a trick? He might well be. We could spring him for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Ross, thanks really for popping in this morning. My pleasure. It is 42 minutes past eight on this Wednesday morning. We've got Phil Egan popping into studio next.